I've played a couple different rebalance ROM hacks for Fire Emblem the Sacred Stones, and most of them have been really cool. But every time I play one, I think about how I would rebalance the game. So I decided to stop thinking about it, learn a bit of FE Builder, and actually do the rebalance I want. So this video is going to be going over what changes I made to Sacred Stones, why I made them, and what the goals of my rebalance were. So sort of like a video devlog. You'll find a link to the rebalance in the video description if you want to try it out. Okay, so starting off with the goals of the rebalance. My main goal was to keep the experience relatively close to vanilla FE8, but with tweaks to adjust things that I find annoying or frustrating when I play FE8. So you aren't going to see giant changes in this hack. The goal was more to touch up the FE8 experience, make rough-to-use units a little less painful, and make some minor changes to some maps and unappealing promotion choices in order to make them a little more appealing. Hence why I call it a rebalance and not a remake. Basically, I just wanted to make a patch that I could load up when I feel like replaying Sacred Stones, that has everything I love from the vanilla Sacred Stones experience, which is most of the game, but a few changes to things I find annoying. So most of the changes here aren't meant to do anything drastic, like take a bad unit to good. For example, the changes I made to Gilliam aren't going to be skyrocketing him up anyone's tier list, but the goal was just to make him a little more appealing or make him a little more fun for people that choose to use him. One constraint I put on this rebalance is that I decided not to implement any nerfs. The most relevant unit I considered nerfing was Seth, but I decided the goal of the patch was just to make weaker stuff more appealing and reduce some annoyances, not to make the existing options worse to use. But the thing with Sacred Stones is that if you don't nerf Seth, you really can't nerf anything else, because if you nerf something like Wyvern Knight but not Seth, that just makes Cormag worse, and now you're even more incentivized to Seth sweep all the time. So since I didn't nerf Seth, nothing else is getting nerfed either. Also, I didn't really touch Ephraim mode in this ROM hack because I don't like Ephraim mode that much, and I don't play it enough to have a lot of experience with it. All of the changes were designed with Erica mode in mind, so play Erica mode. It's good, I promise. But before we get into the changes I made, a big thank you to my geckos on Patreon and a shout out to my skinks, Red Mage Morgan, Chicken, Morg Wolf, Upscale Furry Trash, Cosplay Sylveon, Emma, Van West, Ike Poo, Lucy Sev, Romeo, Wingman, Lonely Voxel, Aaron Geddon, Mikabre, and Stars to Art. I really appreciate all of your support, and if you want to support the channel and appear in videos like this, you'll find a link to the Patreon in the video description. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into the changes I made, starting with individual units going mostly in recruitment order. First up, I gave Erica a little bit of love. This is the unit I made the most statistical changes to because she's a bit of an unfortunate unit in vanilla FE8. She's really not bulky, and she's actually not fast enough to consistently double as early as Chapter 2 if she doesn't hit a speed level. And at that point, it's pretty painful to level her up. Also, she gets two shot by early enemies. So here's the changes I made. First, her bulk. I gave her 4 extra HP and 2 extra defense. And that might sound like a lot, but in my playtesting, she still feels pretty squishy. And I also reduced the growth in each of those stats by 5%, meaning that over the course of the game, you will expect Erika to gain 1 to 2 less points of HP and defense by endgame. So this is an early game boost, and by the end of the game, Erika will just be slightly bulkier than usual on average. I made the change this way because I think in vanilla Sacred Stones, if you do use Erica, her late game bulk isn't great, but it's also not a disaster, so I didn't think she needed a huge increase to her late game bulk. And I gave her a different late game buff that I'm going to talk about later, so the goal with this change was mostly just to make her bulkier in the early game. I also gave Erica one more point of base speed, the reason being that early Iron Axe Brigands and Fighters can have a speed of 6, so if they don't roll down on speed, Erica's 9 base speed in vanilla is one short of doubling them. Even if you gave her a couple levels, it's very possible for her to miss her 60% speed growth before these chapters. With this one point of speed, it's just a little bit easier and more consistent for Erica to double in the early game, which makes it easier to get her some early EXP and get the ball rolling if you want to use Erica. Additionally, I upped Erica's sword rank from E to D. This makes it less of a pain to get her to C rank by the time Joshua shows up, which means his killing edge becomes an option for her if you want her to use it. I also think that D rank just makes more sense for Erica. The story establishes that while Erica doesn't have battle experience, she's had some training, and that feels more like a D rank than an E rank to me. Lastly, I made two item changes that are only relevant to Erica that I'm going to talk about here. First, I increased the Rapier's Might by 1 from 7 to 8. This is just to give an early boost to Erica and help her out against early calves and armors, 
and it also makes the second rapier you get from a village in Distant Blade a little more exciting. Hopefully, by the time you're through these rapiers, she's hit a couple strength levels and is on her way to being a more competent unit without her PRF weapon. Second, I made Sieglind in the late game a 1-2 range sword. Part of Erika's issue in the late game is that while she can kill enemies at one range with Sieglind, your other units can do the same but are either more bulky or can also do it at two range or both. With two range on Sieglind, it becomes a lot easier to find things for Erika to do, even if you haven't trained her much. I didn't make any changes to Ephraim's holy weapon, he already feels fine in the late game and he already has 1-2 range. So this was just to touch Erika up a bit and bring her closer to on par with her brother. So with these changes, my hope is that using Erika is a little more appealing, especially in the early game, and that she won't feel like as much of a liability as she can on some maps in vanilla FE8. Most other units are going to be a lot quicker to talk about than Erika, like Gilliam, who I just gave an extra 2 points of defense to, going up to 11 from 9. Gilliam is supposed to be tanky, but his defense isn't that much higher than your other units, and he often takes more damage since he gets doubled more often than them. The extra 2 points of defense just helps him actually be tanky like he's supposed to be. Next up is Garcia, who I increased from level 4 to 6, because he's supposed to be a veteran, so level 4 feels a little low for that. Initially, this is the only thing I changed, because I think his stats work fine, but I went back and also gave him a point of defense and skill, because I didn't want those two levels to feel completely empty for people that want to actually train him and use him long term, but I didn't want to give him stats like speed or strength that would make him worse at setting up kills for your other units either. So Garcia shouldn't perform too much differently than usual, he'll be slightly more consistent and slightly bulkier and slightly closer to promotion, but largely he does the same thing he does in Vanilla here. After Garcia, we recruit Naomi in Chapter 3, and I upped her level to 3 and gave her her average stats at level 3, but rounded optimistically. The main reason for this change is that you get an Orion's Bolt in Chapter 6 that I feel like I rarely ever see actually get used. I would like Naomi to be a little closer to level 10, so that if you want to use that Orion's Bolt, it's not as much of a pain. Level 3 felt like the highest I could justify making her given her backstory. I actually thought about adding a skills patch specifically just to give Naomi Paragon, but ultimately decided not to do that and just made her level 3 instead. After Naomi is Loot, and I made two changes to Loot. First, I increased her base con from 3 to 4. In Vanilla Sacred Stones, Loot is weighed down by literally every tome at base. Now she's not weighed down by fire. She still has the same con as usual once she promotes, but that's fine because her con is fine when she promotes in Vanilla Sacred Stones. In Mage Knight, she doesn't get weighed down by fire or thunder. The other change I made to Loot was switching the village she joins from. In Vanilla, Loot joins from the bottom left village in Chapter 4, and oftentimes this means she doesn't really get to participate much in the map, which is a shame because it's a great map for leveling up a low-level unit like Loot. So I made her join from the village you start right next to instead. This way, if you want to use Loot, you can grab her turn 1 and she can get in on the monster-killing action. I also changed the bottom left village, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Next up is Ford, and Ford was kind of a tricky one because I think he's fine in a vacuum. The big problem for Ford is just that he's worse than Kyle and Franz, and they all sort of fill the same role. So there's not much reason to use Ford. So my goal here was to add a niche for Ford without just making him better than Kyle. Because if you make him better than Kyle, then Kyle just becomes the new Ford. So what I did was reduce Ford's con by 2 and gave him 2 points of speed to compensate. This largely keeps Ford's combat the same, since speed is always at least as good as Khan. But now, promoted Ford has 16 aid, meaning he can pick up units like Hero, Garrick, and Dussel, while other paladins can't. So now each Cav has some reason you might use them. Franz if you want an early investment target and the best offensive stats. Kyle if you want a decent combat unit that can take advantage of the experience in 5x. And Ford if you want to be able to ferry Garrick and Dussel around with a paladin. The next unit I made a change to was Marissa, who I wanted to keep as a low-level mid-game training project, because I feel like that's the charm of Marissa. But I wanted to make it easier to get her off the ground, and the way I did that was by increasing her sword rank from D to C, and her con from 5 to 7. Last time I used Marissa, it was in a draft, and I was shocked to realize that she actually can't use the killing edge at base, and she's weighed down enough by heavier swords that her 13 speed is actually not enough. Particularly when weighed down, Marissa can fail to double some generics. With Sea Swords and 7 Con, you can hand her a Killing Edge, she won't be weighed down, and it makes her training arc a whole lot less painful. 
But I still wanted to keep her as the funny project unit she is, because that's what I and a lot of other people like about her. So this should just make the early goings of the training arc a little bit nicer. Right after Marissa, we recruit La Rochelle, and I made two adjustments to her. First, I increased her staff rank from D to C. I made this change mainly because D rank is pretty low for the time La Rochelle joins. At C, she gets access to some better staves and is that much closer to the really strong staves at B and A. C is the staff rank Mulder joined with back in Chapter 2, so I don't think it's too much for La Rochelle in Chapter 11. The other change I made to La Rochelle was increasing her base level from 3 to 6. Actually, I didn't touch her bases at all. The goal of this change was just to get La Rochelle to promotion quicker. I like her as a growth unit with unexciting bases, so I wanted to keep the unexciting bases. And promotion is also big for her, because she gets an extra point of move, she gets magic so you can start feeding her kills. So I just want her to be able to get to promotion a little bit faster. So this way, La Rochelle is still a grindy unit, but you don't have to grind quite as long to hit the payoff. Once the route split ends, we have Noel, and all I did for him was up his skill from 8 to 11. Noel has really bad luck, and this causes him to get crit all the time, but he's also inaccurate. I think this is a funny thing for his character, for his luck to be terrible, so I wanted to keep that. But I would also like him to be able to hit the broad side of a barn, so I gave him some skill. He'll still get crit, but he hits more often now. And lastly, for unit changes, I bumped up the growths of all of the trainee units. I gave Ross plus 10% speed and defense growth, Amelia plus 10% strength and defense, and Ewan plus 10% magic and speed. The goal here was just to give the trainees a little bit of a boost. I think they work pretty well in vanilla, and this shows in how popular they are. But it really bothers me that you train Ross for 10 levels of journeyman, then 10 levels of pirate, then promote him into berserker, and he's practically Dazla too. So this just gives you a bit more of a reward for training the trainees for a lot of levels. Those were the changes I made to specific characters, which will hopefully make some of them a little bit easier to use, but without majorly changing the balance of the game. Sacred Stones is already a pretty easy game, so I didn't want to create any additional godlike units beyond the ones that already exist. I did make some changes to class promotion gains as well. In vanilla Sacred Stones, there are a lot of promotions where one option is simply way better than the other one, and I've tried to take the worst option in each of these and bump them up a bit. In most cases, there's still a somewhat clear better choice, but at least the worse option feels a little bit better to use, so hopefully you won't feel like you're shooting yourself in the foot by putting a unit in a class you like that isn't as good as its alternative. Let's start with Sage. In vanilla, Mage Knight is basically just better than Sage. You get move, a horse, extra con, and more magic on promo if you go Mage Knight. So to give Sage a boost, I upped the magic you gain from promoting to Sage from 1 to 2, so now you get the same magic gain in both classes, and I upped Sage's starting staff rank from D to C. The goal here was to differentiate why you might choose these classes. Mage Knight is better for combat, because loot gets functionally additional speed from Mage Knight Khan, and the higher move lets her position more advantageously. But the ability to promote and get C rank staves makes it a lot more realistic for her to get to warp in a timely manner, or other higher rank staves. So as a sage, she can more easily fill the role someone like Arter often fills in Sacred Stones, where you have good mid-game combat and then access to powerful staves later. But if you don't care about staffing and you just want good combat and mobility, you'll still go Mage Knight. Next, we can look at the Armor Knight promotion paths, and this one was sort of awkward, because I wanted to buff Great Knight to make it more competitive with Paladin for Cavaliers, but it also compares favorably to General, and I didn't want to make General feel even less appealing. So, I gave Great Knight a buff, and I gave General a bigger buff. For Great Knight, I just upped the defense you get upon promoting to the class by one. In vanilla Sacred Stones, Paladin and Great Knight actually both give you the same amount of defense, but I think most players kind of expect Great Knight to be bulkier. I mean, it looks bulkier. So now you actually get more defense for going into Great Knight. In exchange, I lowered Great Knight's res by one so that Paladins have a one-point lead there, just to differentiate the classes a little bit but I think the one point of defense is a lot more important than the one point of res. For general, I increased the defense, strength, and speed that you get from the promotion bonus by one. This isn't going to be enough to make generals really good, they're still too slow mobility-wise, but if you promote to general, it's because you want a walking combat god, and you don't really care about how fast it moves. So I wanted to make sure that promoting into general at least gives you the big combat boost that the class seems to promise, so I buffed the combat stats. Alright, next up, let's talk about the Flyers. In Vanilla Sacred Stones, Wyvern Knight is pretty much the king. 
It gives more speed than Wyvern Lord and a lot more con than Falcon Knight, and swords aren't really enough to make up for the lower functional speed since most of the time you would rather use a lance anyway. So for Falcon Knight, I bumped its speed up on promotion from 2 to 3. In vanilla, Falcon and Wyvern Knight both give 2 speed promoting from Pegasus Knight. I think Falcon should give more speed when not weighed down. Wyvern will still be faster with weapons that aren't light because it gives constitution, but at least now there are times where Falcon Knight is the faster option. Additionally, I increased the starting sword rank for Falcon Knights from E to C. Swords aren't amazing in Sacred Stones, particularly if you're stuck on irons. At C rank, Falco Knights have the option of using some of the better options like the Killing Edge and Armor Slayer, and with a little bit more work you can get up to Brave and Silver Sword rank. For Wyvern Lord, I upped the strength on promotion from Wyvern from 2 to 3. Wyvern Knight is a lot faster than Lord, and Cormag, the only unit that can make this promotion choice, would really like the speed to double more. If he goes Lord, he doubles less, but he should pack more of a punch. This helps with that. I also increased the speed bonus for Lord from 0 to 1, Cormac really wants that speed. It's hard to justify Lord over Knight when Knight gives him so much more speed on promotion. So I gave Lord one speed so that Cormag is still getting some of the speed that he wants with this promotion path. So that's the Flyers. Next, let's look at Archer promotion options. At first, I thought this was going to be another tricky one where I wanted to give Ranger a small boost so that it would compare better to Hero for Garrick's promotion but it's already better than Sniper. But then I realized that Naomi is a girl and Garrick is a guy and Sacred Stones does separate promotion bonuses for girls and guys. So I could buff Naomi's Sniper bonuses and Garrick's Ranger bonuses without changing them for each other. So I gave Naomi's Sniper a pretty significant boost, increasing its speed bonus from 1 to 3, its strength bonus from 3 to 4, and its skill bonus from 1 to 2. The skill bonus was just so that Sniper doesn't give less skill than Ranger, and the other two were because Naomi could use some help doubling in the mid-game, and some extra strength to help fix her noodle arms from her low base strength. Ranger offering move, a horse, and swords is a big deal. Sniper needs big stats to compensate. For Garrick's Ranger promotion, I upped the base bow rank from D to C. This isn't a huge difference, it just lets him have access to Killer Bow immediately, and with a smaller amount of grinding, get access to Brave and Silver Bows. I also increased the speed bonus for Ranger from 1 to 2. This gives the class the same speed bonus as Hero, and the reason I did this is because the extra speed is actually a pretty big deal for Garrick. He wants a few points of speed to double faster enemies, and his growth is only 30%, so getting two points of speed from promotion is a big boon for Hero and allows Garrick to more consistently double enemies like Kalak. I wanted the choice between Ranger and Hero to have less to do with doubling and be more about whether you want the 1-2 range from Hero or the horse from Ranger, so I evened out the speed difference. Speaking of Hero, I kept that class the same, but let's look at its other half from the fighter base class, Warrior. I gave Warrior an extra point of strength on promotion, increasing it from 1 to 2. I don't believe this makes a huge difference for either unit that can become a Warrior as they both have great strength already. But it feels wrong that Warrior and Hero give the same strength to me in vanilla Sacred Stones, so this is more of a flavor thing. More importantly, I gave Warrior one point of speed rather than the zero it gives in vanilla. Ross and Garcia both need speed pretty badly. Getting zero speed from their promotion feels like a non-starter, so by adding one point of speed to Warrior, these units can get a little bit of the doubling help they need, while Hero will remain enticing since it gives a little more speed, and Ross and Garcia need every point that they can get. I also upped the base bow rank for Warrior from E to C. Bows don't really feel like a huge deal for a class that already has 1-2 range, and they're pretty unappealing when you're stuck on irons, so this way Warriors have access to some better bows immediately. Alright, just a couple more classes left, and one of them is Assassin. And the change for Assassin is small, I just gave them one more point of strength, going from a 1 strength promotion bonus to 2. This makes the strength bonus the same as the one from Swordmaster, and I did this because I think the innate crit bonus from Swordmaster is better than Silencer from Assassin, so I don't think Swordmaster also needs to give up the point of strength. This balances them out, and you can just choose between whether you want Silencer or the crit bonus. And last up, we have the Druid class. In vanilla, Druid isn't that appealing over Summoner, so the goal here was to give Druid some things it's significantly better at compared to Summoner, while Summoner's niche can be, well... Summoning. So I gave Druid higher weapon ranks, its anima rank going up to C from D, and staves going up to C from E. This is a class that you do not have access to until pretty late in the game, so E staves feels pretty meaningless. 
It's technically staff utility, but it's really just heal and you have access to other units with better staffing by now. But with Sea Staves, Druid has options like Barrier and Recover, and it becomes a lot more realistic to hit Physic or Warp Rank by the end of the game. Same with Anima Magic, there's just not a lot of game left when this class exists, so starting at low weapon ranks feels pretty rough. I also increased the Magic Promotion bonus for Druid from 0 to 2, so now Druid has better combat and better staff utility compared to Summoner, while Summoner still has its niche of providing summons. So that's what I did with all the classes, and now we can get into adjustments I made to maps. Much like with characters and classes, I tried not to make massive changes to most maps, just a few adjustments to some things that annoy me in Vanilla Sacred Stones. The first change I made was in Chapter 4, I mentioned this when I was talking about loot, but I went ahead and flipped the villages so that loot joins from the North Village instead of the Southern one. This just lets loot get in on the action a little faster, and I also replaced the item from the other village. Normally it's an Iron Axe, which feels pretty lame. I replaced it with a Fiend Cleaver, which is an effective axe against monsters. This is a nice map to test that out in, and in the next map there's spiders that you could fight, and then you'll probably just hang on to it until the monster maps in the mid-game. The next change I made was in 5x, and all I did here was add a door to the beginning of the map that lets you get to the boss faster. 5x is a pretty boring chapter, it's functionally a long hallway where either Orson one-rounds everything or sets up kills for whoever you've decided to bless with the chapter 5x experience. Making this map interesting would require a pretty big overhaul, so I've instead decided to just add a way to let you get through it a little quicker. You can still play the map the normal way if you want to maximize experience, but if you're like me and you've played this game a bajillion times and dread this map, you can just pop through the door and get through the map pretty quickly. Chapter 6 is the next map I changed, and I made a couple adjustments here. First, the village in the south that normally gives an antitoxin now gives a restore staff. The restore staff fulfills the same role as the antitoxin of clearing poison, but has enough more use cases that a player might actually be happy to get it, versus the antitoxin, which is pretty disappointing. This is also the only change I made where I was considering Ephraim Route. A common pain point is sometimes a player will get to Chapter 4 of Ephraim Route, realize they don't have a Restore Staff, and then have a miserable time working through the Berserk Druids. This Restore Staff in Chapter 6 just gives you an opportunity to get a way to deal with those Berserk Druids for free, so if you forget to buy one for Chapter 14, you'll still have the one from Chapter 6 most likely. I also added a new village to the top left of the map with some enemies guarding it. The goal here was to add some objective to the map that's a little harder to get to than the southern village and that you can't just throw Seth at if you want to send him directly towards the boss. This is because a common play pattern for this map is for Seth to just run forward and kill the boss, which is one of the safest ways to tackle this map. To disincentivize Seth from soloing this objective, I did a couple things. First, there's a mercenary in front of the new village with a Zanbato, and Seth can't double him at base. Second, I added forests next to the village that slow Seth down a bit on his way to the boss, so if you want to Seth sweep all of the objectives on this map, it's a little tougher without facing reinforcements, and if you want to charge Seth straight at the boss, there's still something for your other units to do in the form of this new village. I also made sure to put the Zanbato mercenary in view of where the player starts. No matter how you set up your units, as long as you do full deployment, you will see this Zanbato mercenary, so players won't get jump scared by the horse effective weapon. Next up is Chapter 12 of Erika Route, and I made some heavier changes to this one. First, I trimmed back the mountains to reduce the amount of one-tile choke points on the map. I really hate one-tile choke points because they encourage a strategy of plopping your strongest unit on a point and letting them fight everything. Without one-tile choke points, if you want to do that, you need at least two good units. I also moved the spiders that start on the map slightly closer to the edges of the mountain, because in vanilla Sacred Stones, they take a really long time to crawl off the mountains and into the action, so in this version of the game, they'll get off the mountains faster and attack your units sooner. I also changed the item you get from one of the villages on this map. Instead of giving you a barrier staff, the village on this map now gives you a hero crest, and the barrier has been moved to chapter 14, replacing the hero crest on that map. One of the things I don't like about Erika Route is how long you have to wait for the second hero crest, especially since there's a lot of incentive to give the first one to Garrick. So I moved the chapter 14 one up to here so that you can get Joshua or Garcia promoted sooner. Lastly, I made this a kill boss map. This is actually a bit of a flavor fail, as story-wise it makes more sense for you to have to route the monsters, but if you've ever heard me talk about this map, you know I hate it. 
It takes too long for enemies to walk off the mountains, there are tons of monotonous reinforcements to fight through, and none of this is very interesting. So I'm accepting a small loss in terms of flavor to make the map a lot less painful for myself. In my testing, I even found the reinforcements were still relevant since blitzing through the map to rush the boss causes them to spawn sooner. So if you rush Seth ahead to go kill the boss, your units that you left behind will still have to deal with the reinforcements. In Chapter 13, I made two changes. First, I changed it so that when Pablo spawns later in the map, he doesn't have a purge, and I gave him a droppable energy ring as well. I've always thought that the purge on a reinforcement felt a little mean on this map. You usually only experience this if you're struggling with the other enemies, so it feels like kicking the player while they're down to spawn a purge sage that might snipe one of your dudes. I gave him the energy ring because I like it when there's an incentive to kill optional bosses, so now there is a reward for dealing with more enemies and taking out Pablo. In Chapter 14, I mostly just shuffled some treasure around. Since the hero crest from this map is now in Chapter 12, I moved the barrier to this map. It didn't really make sense for the enemy that normally has the hero crest to have the barrier staff though, so instead I put the barrier in the chest on this map that usually has the dragon spear, and moved the dragon spear to the armor knight that's in the same room where the hero crest used to be. Flavor-wise, it just makes more sense to me for the items to be laid out in this way. I also went ahead and made the boss Carlisle's windsword droppable, and added windswords to the secret shop on this map. I think the windsword is a fun weapon, and it's a shame that you don't get one in the main campaign. It's cool for swords to have more expensive access to 1-2 range for a limited portion of the game. Plus, as Fire Emblem Engage taught us, the windsword is one of Erika's iconic weapons, so we need to make sure she has a chance to get one. The last map that I made changes to was Chapter 19, and here I wanted to open up the map a bit more in the bottom half. A common strategy is to just pick up the green unit and move him to one of the treasure rooms and defend it with two tanky units in the choke point. So I opened the choke points up to make that slightly more difficult. Additionally, I added a couple warriors on the staircase in front of the boss to make it slightly harder to skip the map by killing him. You can still warp past these guys, but you have to move a little further into the map than previously and probably fight a few more enemies. The map is still very cheesable, it's just a little bit more effort to do the cheese now. So those were all the changes I made for the first draft of my Erica mode rebalance. I think the unit that benefits the most is either Erica or Loot. I talked about Erica and how she benefits already, but for Loot, access to C-rank staves on promotion and getting to suck up the experience in Chapter 4 is pretty nice for her. But mostly, I hope that this makes some fun and not-so-good units in Sacred Stones feel just a little bit better to use without changing the game so much that it doesn't feel like Sacred Stones to me anymore. I'm probably going to do a second draft as I play through this a bit more because honestly, I found doing the hacking really fun, so I want to do it more. But I'd love to hear what you think though, because like I said, there probably will be another revision of this hack or another version of it where I make some bigger changes that stray further from vanilla Sacred Stones. So thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you liked it, consider leaving a like or subscribe so that you never miss an upload. And if you want to chat about Fire Emblem more, consider hopping in the community discord that you'll find linked in the video description. Either way, thanks for hanging out and have yourself a lovely week.